Daniel Went says, I've been inspired by your concept of first order retrievability. This is my preference for working in which I have the tools that I need on a daily or hourly basis set out so that they're all at my disposal, that I don't have to move anything out of the way to get to the tools that I use every day. Things like Forstner bits or metal punches or calipers or uh, T-handled Allen wrenches. Like those are the things I use on a constant basis and thus they're just out and ready. Uh, second order retrievability for me is like the drawer that I open to find my chisels. They're all in here. Um, but first order retrievability is mission critical stuff is at my disposal. Daniel Wentz says, uh, I'm hoping to nudge the organization of the shop where I work in this direction. Excellent. Uh, Daniel says he shares the space with other colleagues, so mutual respect and consensus is important. I'm glad you said that. Uh, where would you begin? Where would you begin? That was Sean Charlesworth. He does not know that I am working. <laughs> um, where would you begin to audit the things that need to change in order to promote first order retrievability? So I hear a desire in that question that I often hear in questions about organization. And the desire is, give me an answer that will help me organize. And the answer is, I can't. The answer is, it's not a task, it's a process. So, it's an, it's an iterative process in which you try stuff and it works, and you try stuff and it doesn't work, and you keep on going. Um, if you work in an organization and you share the tools with other people, there's a lot of co considerations about first order retrievability. Um, I don't get the idea that you have some sort of locked tool corral, which often is in a, in a, in a workplace shop is a key aspect of the safety protocol. Um, so let's, let's not deal with that. Uh, but you say you have other colleagues and you want to have a mutual respect and consensus with them, even though you may not all agree on what the most important for starter retrievable tools actually are. Um, I would suggest a meeting, a gathering in which you talked about what each of you considered to be your most important first order retrievable tools. For one of you who's a woodworker, it may be the clamps, that they don't like going into a drawer for all the clamps and they'd like to have them all lined up on the wall. That's a totally reasonable thing for a woodworker to want that a generalist might not consider such a high need. Um, somebody else may feel like they need all the screwdrivers out. You're never going to achieve a, a perfect mix of everything, but you could prioritize. And, uh, you know, I would imagine in a shop in which there are multiple people using the space, if consensus and respect are already built into the relationship, you are way ahead of the game because that is really, really important. Um, I might suggest like overlapping your desires and each of you comes to the table with your top five first order retrievable tools in the order, right? So the number one one is the one, the, the deal breaker. You want that one out. Um, you can't have all the tools out. So you have to limit your, your, your ambition there, but you also got to kind of come up with a list and then a way to actually make those things first order retrievable. Right, okay, so yeah. First meeting is to go over, or the first part of this, this gathering is to go over what each of you stakeholders considers for the necessary first order retrievable tools. Then once you've assembled a list of the tools you've agreed upon that will be first order retrievable, I think that each person that has, that like, each person should tackle how the first order retrievability works for the objects they're interested in. So if you want the screwdrivers out, how do you want them out? Do you want them on a shelf? Do you want them lined up on a thing? Do you want them in holes? You know, that, that matters. Uh, so each of you would have a plan for how that thing gets made first order retrievable. And then once you have a plan and the objects, then it's time to figure out the layout of where they live in the space. And you're gonna get some of this wrong. So uh, organizationally, 
<sighs> Don't get me wrong. Every six months I go into my basement and I like clean out the whole garage and I'm like, the garage is clean, yay everybody. And then the garage gets dirty again. But every time it's clean, I think I'm gonna keep it this way. And you, you never do, you never do. So recognize that, that prop, like, and I'm still coming up with my own first order retrievability here. I have to retackle this whole shelf because there's a lot of link rot on it, as it were. There are some tools I don't use all the time. There are some tools that I need to make more space for. Um, it is a process. That's maybe one of the main things I say in these live streams. It's not a plan, it's a process. Um, let's see here. Ah. Uh, Patricia Hogarty asks a question. Um, she says, I've been working in my dining room makeshift studio while our basement gets remodeled. I've been working here about nine months with selective supplies. Right. You've taken your shop and you've ensmallened it in order to use it in the dining room without disrupting too much of your life. I've been there. Um, sounds like the remodel is almost done. And she says, this is a great time to assess what should be in my cockpit when I move everything back from storage. Any suggestions besides making a list of what I've learned to keep near? That's my first suggestion. Make a list of what you've learned to keep near. But you had a shop space. You cleared all your stuff out of it. You created a new shop, interim shop space, a liminal space. And now you're about to move back into the shop space. So this is a great exercise to think about, not just to start with, how do you want it to feel to work in the new space that was your old space? How do you want it to feel? How you want something to feel is a really, really regular refrain in my head. Um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm slowly moving back towards television. I'm slowly moving towards some pitches and some ideas for television shows. Um, but one of the ways in which I'm thinking about making television is not just the concept and not just who I want to work with, but really how I want it to feel to make a show. I've spent enough years of my life making television shows and I've had, <clears throat> I've had amazing experiences and I've had traumatic experiences. I've had phenomenal collaborators and shite collaborators. I've had wonderful days and rough days. And thinking about how I want it to feel, how I want it to integrate into my life is a really important part of my practice. Um, and one of the reasons to think like that, how do you want it to feel, is when in the future, when future you encounters that feeling, you can be like, oh yeah, I thought about this and this is what I was wanting. Here we are. So I would submit that given that you moved out of your shop and you made a smaller interim liminal shop, your experience in that liminal shop was very different than your big shop, to be sure. Maybe there's some things about the and small end shop that worked better for you or surprised you or that you realize you didn't need access to this or that thing uh, as regularly as you thought you did. So I would just spend some time thinking about how the projects went over the last nine months you've been working at your dining table uh, and apply that knowledge to the layout of the space you are now creating downstairs. Yeah. It's about, when I think about how I want the shop to feel, like a clean bench gives me that good feeling. It gives me a feeling of possibility and it makes my hands itch to work. And that's like, I'm investing in making stuff when I clean the bench at the end of the day. Um, and I'm thinking about how I want the work process to feel. So yeah, this is another one in which it's, it, the doing, the what should I do to organize the new space? My, my, my advice is to think about how you want it to feel. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects 
questions. You get to ask direct questions during my live streams, and we have some members-only videos, including the Adam real-time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.